The sun is a mass of incandescent gas, a giant nuclear furnace. Without the sun, without a doubt, there would be no you and me, but the sun is hot and it is not a place where we could live, or is it? Welcome back to Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, and welcome to our fourth year. I am your host, the aforementioned Isaac Arthur. If there is one thing this channel tends to be known for, it is truly enormous and over-the-top concepts like artificial planets or moving solar systems or even galaxies, but we always try to stick to things inside known physical laws, and on those rare occasions we don't, we hang a flag on it and explain both why it probably can't be done and some of the other potential applications it could be used for that get missed when using it in science fiction. We are going to stay inside those limits of known physical science today, but I'll just warn from the outset that we are going to be pushing that a lot. When I first suggested an episode about colonizing the Sun as a chapter in our ongoing look at colonizing the solar system, the Outward Bound series, the initial response was mostly to assume I was joking or talking about Dyson Swarms. In fact, I mostly was, joking that is. About halfway through last year I gathered up volunteers to help review the scripts for the episodes and to bounce episode ideas off of, and while I hate to admit it, their initial response at how crazy it was is actually what spurred me to give it a more serious look. While oh yeah I'll show you isn't the best motivation for doing things, I'm glad I did succumb to that because it made me try to tackle the problem and it turned out there are a lot of options there for utilizing the sun in a very hands-on manner. Now in truth we have talked about utilizing the sun before on many occasions. A sun-encompassing swarm of habitats or power collectors or mirrors, a Dyson Sphere, is something I mention on the channel at least once a month, and it is a type of stellar engine, a device or group of devices meant to utilize most of a star's energy to some purpose, and we discussed others like the Shakata Thruster or Nikol Dyson Beam. We will review those concepts today and some new ones. We've also talked about star lifting, a way of mining resources from the Sun, which contains 99.8% of all resources in the solar system, not just hydrogen or helium, but all the other elements too. We'll talk about that today too, but we are going to go further and by the end of the episode we'll be talking about walking around the Sun or even in the Sun. This is important as our main motivation though. 99.8% of the solar system is compacted into that giant ball of shining plasma. 998 out of every thousand atoms are in the Sun, one is in Jupiter, and the remaining one is spread over the solar system, mostly in the remaining three gas giants. Classic space colonization tends to ignore all that mass as being unavailable, even the stuff in gas giants. Truth be told, even most of the mass in planets gets treated as serving no purpose but to generate gravity and fuel the occasional land replenishment via volcano. Even concepts like Dyson Swarms typically ignore all that mass in a sun as anything other than a source of energy, a very big source of energy admittedly, less than a billionth of the sun's light ever reaches Earth, and only a small portion of that gets used for anything other than heat. The ratio is so small it would be like creating an entire hurricane just so you can get a glass of water, or breaking into Fort Knox to steal one person's gold wedding ring. This gets at the entire appeal of a Dyson Sphere, you use all that energy, not just the minuscule portion of it that hits planets. You stick wads of solar panels or artificial habitats around a star in a roughly spherical cloud to use all that light up. Yet again, it still ignores all that mass in the Sun, except as a power source. Most people find even a Dyson Sphere to be a pretty ridiculous object, albeit mostly because even those who have heard of one think it's supposed to be some giant inside-out planet. This was never what a Dyson Sphere was, but the misnomer stuck so instead we call the original a Dyson Swarm. Such a construct takes a ton of mass to build and how much depends on how thick you want to build it. 
There's plenty of mass even just on Mercury to build solar panels all around the Sun, but trying to build habitats with the available mass in the solar system is much trickier, which is where we saw the value of star lifting, harvesting a star for its matter, not just its energy. This of course is a bit of an issue. You can't land on the Sun with a bucket and a shovel and start mining for metals, not because they aren't there. In fact, if you scoop some solar matter off the surface, there's a lot of stuff besides hydrogen and helium in that, over 1%. The reason is because it's so hot, and also because a bucket full of the Sun contains virtually no matter, less than a bucket of air. The photosphere, the nominal surface of the Sun, where the light mostly comes from, is about 5700 Kelvin, hotter than any known element or alloy can remain solid at, and it is a surface only in the sense that we can't see deeper than that. The density of the ground is about one ten millionth that of the various rocks and dirt we walk on, and actually only about a thousandth as dense as the air you are breathing. Above that is the chromosphere, and then the corona, both of which are increasingly less dense, and finally the heliosphere, which is actually where all the planets are located. So this image we have of the Sun as a sort of molten liquid is all wrong, since you don't crash into it any more than you crash into a sky. It's not even a gas either, but rather a plasma. It's not dense at all, though far more so than red giant stars, what our Sun will eventually turn into, which are so thin that you could fly a spaceship through one if it wasn't for the heat. It gets denser as you go deeper, eventually getting to be dozens of times the density of lead at the center. But you have to go quite deep before it even gets as thick as Earth's atmosphere, let alone oceans. There's very little matter immediately under your feet on the Sun, again much less than air, and gravity is 28 times higher than on Earth, so you'd fall down very fast with all that force acting on you and almost nothing in the way. If you could dangle Earth down a long cord into the Sun, like an apple on a fishing hook lowered into the sea, it would actually take quite a while to destroy the planet. It wouldn't detonate in an instant like people would visualize. Indeed when we discussed one of the types of stellar engine, the weaponized Death Star-like variety called a Nikol Dyson Beam, we saw that you need to leave one on full power on Earth for around a week to vaporize it, though you'd roast the biosphere off in minutes. The Sun gives off 63 megawatts of light per square meter, around 60,000 times what the light intensity hitting Earth is. So if you had a floor between you and the Sun and poked a hole in it with a needle, it would light that room up as effectively as a normal window, even diluted by spreading out for 150 million kilometers on its way to Earth. It's still so energy dense that looking at it will blind you. So at first glance it would seem like being anywhere near the Sun ought to obliterate you, but it's important to understand that damage is not just about temperature, it's about energy transfer. We think of space as cold, but there are plenty of giant pockets of it a lot hotter than Earth is, and you wouldn't be burned to death in them because they are so thin no real heat will transfer to you. Your oven is a lot hotter than a pot of boiling water, but if you stick your hand in your oven without touching any metal for a moment, it's just uncomfortable. Stick your hand in a pot of boiling water for a moment and you are going to get badly scalded. There's a thousand times more particles hitting every chunk of skin in that water than in the hot air. Indeed the surface of the Sun is actually a good deal cooler than its higher layers, the chromosphere and the corona, which are hundreds of times hotter. However, we have two tricks for getting near the Sun. First, until you get to the corona, all you are encountering is a lot of photons and a little solar wind. Photons can be reflected by mirrors. We use a lot of metal foils, silver, aluminum, and gold, though we've got newer materials that work better. People tend to think of mirrors as glass but there's a reason why we talk about them being silvered. We used to use silver plating on the back of them, but aluminum plating is more the norm these days. Not everything reflective to visual light is a good reflector to other frequencies either, so don't assume a traditional mirror you look at your reflection in is ideal. The Sun gives off a lot of light in frequencies we can't see and which typical mirrors don't bounce well. However, if you assumed you had a mirror that was 99% reflected to the Sun's full spectrum, you'd only absorb 1% of the light you normally would, and so you could get to a place where the Sun was 100 times brighter than Earth. 
since light falls with a square of distance that would be 10 times closer, 0.1 AU, a quarter of the distance Mercury is from the Sun, a place already so light blasted that we could only consider colonizing it by living in mushroom habitats and sitting on stilts over the ground and shielded by a big mirror from the Sun. This close to the Sun, only a tenth as far away as Earth is, is actually where we say the Sun officially ends, the outermost edge of the corona. If you make some reflective shield up in front of your spacecraft, you can get this close, 0.1 AU, and indeed the Parker Solar Probe scheduled for launch later this year is supposed to get to just 0.04 AU from the Sun, 10 times closer to the Sun than Mercury is, and 25 times closer than Earth. You can get closer too, either by having a shinier mirror or by having a lot of heat radiators trailing behind in the shield shadow, cooling the shield and radiating heat away in that shadow. As you get closer to the Sun, you eventually need to make the mirror shield more bowl shaped so the whole thing looks like a mushroom, as sunlight is no longer coming directly at you from the front. If you've seen the film Sunshine, which is one of my favorites, at least the first hour before it turns into a horror film, you can see how the ship uses the basic concept with a gold covered forward solar shield reflecting light away. The more you can reflect, the closer you can get to the sun. So how shiny can you make a mirror? Theoretically 100%, and indeed labs have made materials that are completely reflective at a particular frequency keep that in mind for later, but generally a material will reflect different wavelengths of light better or worse, and the Sun emits a wide spectrum of wavelengths. You do get two other problems once you get inside this range though. First, the Sun does radiate more than just photons you can reflect away, and as you get closer you aren't just dealing with a higher density of solar wind, but particles in the Sun's upper atmosphere, the corona, which can be around 2 million Kelvin. Second, the Sun has an insanely powerful and strange magnetosphere, and we can start generating heat by magnetic induction through things. All those particles are ionized so we can reflect or deflect them with a magnetic field, but you need power to run such a thing and that means heat. Nonetheless, if you can bounce away all those particles, no heat will transfer to you, So it's actually conceivable you might be able to get very close, indeed all the way down to the photosphere surface with materials that were ultra-reflective, and by deflecting those ionized particles. This is just inside the realm of known physics, if we move over to science fiction, suns are always treated as automatic kilomajigs. However, those ships often have force fields or wormholes, and if you did have that kind of tech, the game changes. I've pointed out before that a handy power source can be made with a wormhole by dropping one mouth into a star, but you could do that in reverse and suck heat out from a space station inside a star to keep it cool. This is much trickier without such technologies though. You could have a highly conductive or even superconductive material, such as a tether rising off the sun, carrying heat away from your base on the sun as fast as it got in. The problem is, that close to the Sun, light is coming in from every direction below you, much like the Earth and its own horizon when standing on the ground, and indeed from above you too. The chromosphere and corona both emit light, just less than the photosphere, so you need to sheathe those tethers as well. It would also snap. A space elevator is hard to engineer on Earth, when it has to hold up its own weight for thousands of kilometers in Earth gravity. Gravity is even higher on the Sun and you have a lot more of it. You have to be at 5.3 solar radiuses, or about 3 million kilometers above the photosphere, before gravity drops to Earth normal. If you built a sphere that far over the Sun, 3.7 million kilometers in radius, or 0.024 AU, it would have a surface area 330,000 times that of Earth, as big an area compared to Earth as the Sun is massive compared to Earth. If you remember our episode on Mega-Earths, I pointed out there that if you are trying to keep the same surface gravity, there is a linear relationship between the object's mass and the surface area or living space. 10 times the mass, 10 times the surface area, 100 times the mass, 100 times the surface area. Of course the Sun may be 330,000 times as massive as Earth, but as we've mentioned, it gives off enough sunlight to illuminate Earth a couple billion times over again so this sphere would be getting 6,000 times the light you want it to get, 
However, this is about as close to the Sun as a person would want to get since gravity is rising. Using the orbital ring technology we have discussed before, the giant stationary rings full of super fast moving magnetic material, like a pipe full of running water, you could construct a permanent stationary ring around the Sun, assuming you can reflect enough light and deflect enough particles. You could then walk around on top of this ring, with the same gravity as on Earth, and be well inside the Sun's corona. Now, before we ask why anyone would want to live there, let's ask if this is as close as a human could live. Not a cyborg meant for higher gravity or heat tolerance, but an actual normal old human. And the answer is no. You would have to be standing on the ring's surface facing away from the sun as the sun's gravity is pulling you down onto the ring. If the ring was stationary when a person experiences 1G, normal Earth gravity, then if the ring is placed closer to the sun, then the gravity increases. We can offset that increase though by spinning the ring. Spinning the ring has the effect of introducing an artificial gravity on you away from the sun. No matter how much gravity you would use the experience if the ring were stationary, we can offset that by spinning the ring faster so you always experience 1G. Unlike a normal spinning habitat, this ring contains two sections, an inner and an outer, which don't move at the same speed, but whose combined momentum is what they need to orbit classically. In this case, we keep the inner ring stationary and spin the outer one, or even spin the inner one in the opposite direction. You can also keep a third stationary sheath outside this to prevent friction from whatever the environment is outside. This trick can be used to produce low gravity bands near any star, gas giant, or super Earth. See the Orbital Rings episode for a more detailed explanation of the mechanics. Needless to say, it takes a lot of power to run such rings, which are giant magnetic machines, but you aren't short of energy near the Sun, and when it comes to extracting matter from the Sun, the main method of star lifting we've previously discussed specifically uses a giant magnetic ring to rip matter off the star. Other methods all have the problem that it takes huge amounts of energy to lift matter out of a gravity well, but the entire original point of an orbital ring is that it makes a phenomenal way to move huge amounts of matter out of gravity wells. You can also use concentric stacks of them, each a little further out connected with tethers to act as elevators. We've used that trick before, but it has two added advantages here. First, each higher one is getting some light blocked by the lower ones and second, you could probably transport heat up those tethers to help cool the lower ones, ending with one really high up, very wide but perpendicular to the sun. With a lower cross section such a massive radiator serves for the ones below and is a pickup and storage point for ships coming in to collect material harvested below. I should note that our sun is not the only star either, in fact it is on the large and hot side, many are much cooler, even having surface temperatures lower than the melting points of some known materials, and for big red giants they are not only cool but vastly less dense, and using these tricks you might be able to flat out construct machinery right over or even inside their photospheres. We will look at that more, and the interesting case of doing this with white dwarf or neutron stars, in our next episode of Civilizations at the End of Time, Dying Stars. So while we would definitely need to come up with a lot of new technologies to live this close to the sun, we don't necessarily need any new physics. But why live there, in, on, or very near the sun? It is worth noting from the outset, as pointed out in Colonizing Titan, that colonizing is not the same as terraforming, and indeed doesn't necessarily mean anyone lives there, let alone that they need to be traditionally human. We have a lot more options on the table if we are including alternatives like artificial intelligence too, but for today we will assume you need regular old humans on site or in proximity. While it might not be a big hub for actual living, the value of a colony near the sun, if you can successfully build it, is so huge that it would rapidly come to dominate the entire system economy. Even if it only takes a skeleton crew to operate some of those immense machines, so that it was like one person working inside a large modern warehouse, when industrialized you could have trillions of people working there, supplying untoward billions of megatons of raw materials and trillions of gigawatts of power to a growing solar economy. 
There is nothing in this solar system that the Sun doesn't have more of, except empty space and lower temperatures. From the Sun we can run giant energy beams out to distant, energy-hungry colonies, more on that in a moment. We can use it to maneuver and accelerate spaceships, we can harvest it for huge amounts of hydrogen and helium as well as heavier elements. Beyond those, you can use surplus power to run a giant ring-shaped supercollider, which is also basically an orbital ring, to turn lighter elements into heavier ones. You could potentially even be making antimatter or Kugelblitz black holes to store energy or use as spaceship engines. Whenever we talk about fully harnessing the sun for power, I get asked what we would do with all of it, around 20 trillion times humanity's total power consumption. And these are just some examples of what you can do, but in a nutshell, if you've got trillions of times the energy and matter, you run trillions of times the industrial output. Now I want to talk about beam propulsion again, because we've been talking about using lasers to push ships in some of the episodes from late last year, and we just mentioned beaming power. I often mention both as alternatives if we never make fusion reactors a reality. Laser beams spread out gradually with distance, they aren't beams of even width the whole way, and the tighter you can keep them over distance the better. Now the traditional way to make these lasers is to suck up energy from sunlight via solar panels and use that to run a classic laser, albeit a gigantic one. However, that is a fairly inefficient process, and we have a far more efficient, cheaper, and vastly easier option called a stellar laser or stellaser. Here we describe a version conceived decades ago by Steve Nixon, who coined the term Stellaser. We are going to turn the Sun itself into a laser. Now we talk about lasers on this channel a lot, but I've never really explained them, and this seems a good occasion to do so in some detail. At its simplest, a laser consists of a lazy medium we can excite, such as a gas that gets placed between two mirrors. We can excite the medium, usually with electricity or a big lamp, raising the energy of a population of atoms in the medium to the point they behave strangely. They behave less randomly, more in unison, they are stimulated to lays. Mirrors help stabilize the process. As it turns out, the Sun's corona is a natural lazy medium, already conveniently excited by the Sun's brilliance, like a giant lamp, and a rather powerful one at that. In the Sun, an ion is an atom where one or more of its outer electrons has been knocked off. In the Sun's corona, there are naturally occurring heavy ions that have lost several electrons thanks to the high temperature there. Some of these ions are found in that special, higher energy quantum state. What makes that special state special is some atoms can easily enter via collisions, but it's a one-way trip because the normal transitions back to lower energy are forbidden quantum transitions. De-excitation from normal states is easy and fast, but de-excitation from this special state is rare, so these excited ions accumulate in the Sun's corona. A concentration of such excited, but inhibited, particles is called a population inversion. This excited medium provides us with the powerful opportunity we need as it sets the stage for lasing, much like happens in a helium-neon laser, in which excited helium atoms transfer energy to neon atoms by colliding with them. Iron ions in the solar corona are already in this special excited state, all pumped up at 2 million Kelvin, trapped in that state and ready to laze. What do they need to enable lasing? Neos pointed at each other, Neos of a very high reflectivity at the wavelength of interest, such as green light for iron, and as we said, we can make Neos almost perfectly reflective at a specific wavelength these days. These mirrors need to be of high optical quality, very smooth, fairly large diameter, and positioned far enough apart to pass a beam between them, though a small fraction of the solar corona, which is still a large volume. So put them in orbits at the same altitude above the Sun, or any other star, but positioned so the star is almost between the mirrors, just off to one side. Point the mirrors at each other and wait a bit. Spontaneous emission does occur, rarely, despite the forbidden transition. When such a photon happens to come from between the mirrors and directed at one, it will begin to bounce back and forth. As it does, it will encounter excited ions like the one that emitted it, and will stimulate them to emit as well. 
these new photons will be emitted in the same direction and with the same phase as the incoming photon. This is the essence of light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, the laser. After bouncing back and forth a few times, the resonating energy becomes quite large, nearly monochromatic, and mostly in phase or coherent. A few additional components inside the laser cavity will make it very monochromatic and coherent. With good mirrors, the rays will be extremely parallel and will bounce many times. Rays which are not parallel will escape and no longer contribute to the laser's resonant amplification, nor will escaped rays subtract any more from the available energy. After a while, only parallel rays are being amplified. Stalazor mirrors are a bit of a technical challenge, but technology always improves when there is a goal and a motive. Use of large diameter mirrors eases some of the problems and makes it possible to keep a tight beam for a very long way. Huge volumes of solar corona means equally huge energies are stored there and the Stalazor taps into it, organizes it, and unleashes that energy. We could make a small Stalazor with today's technology. You could potentially be making these mirrors thousands of kilometers across, or putting thousands around the Sun. You could also potentially use other substances besides iron as well, you are not limited to that specific element and a green beam. This very simple design is also ideal for use in interstellar travel. We send in an advanced probe that arrives ahead of a larger interstellar vessel to construct a stellazer before the other, bigger ship arrives, and use it to slow the ship down without fuel, as well as provide all the power would-be explorers or colonists might need. It could also be bootstrapped and expanded to assist a second wave of incoming ships moving far faster and carrying more cargo proportionally. So potentially, these are just as useful for arriving at a distant solar system as helping you leave ours. Next time in the Outward Bound series, we will do just that, and jump to Alpha Centauri to discuss interstellar colonization concepts and the specific case of solar systems around binary stars, which has some interesting aspects, restrictions, and possibilities. Binary stars have a lot of differences in how you colonize them than single star systems, and for that matter there's a huge variation in how individual ones behave. Their life cycles and how you go about utilizing them varies by a lot more than just how long they live, and what color they are, and you need to adapt your colonization plans accordingly. As I explained at the start, we are still staying within the limits of known physical science in order to colonize the Sun, and so this absurd sounding proposal is actually not that far-fetched. If you want to understand the scientific possibilities and limitations of modern space travel, then I recommend that you check out Brilliant.org. Their astronomy course provides you with the physical tools that astrophysicists use to understand the cosmos, the life cycles of the stars, and the fate of the universe. Through active problem solving, you build up your frameworks to understand these concepts, instead of just memorizing formulas from a textbook. You can dive right in at whatever your skill level is and explore at your own pace. I can never overemphasize how handy that math and science skill set is to have in your mental toolbox, and Brilliant is a great place to get started. To support the channel and learn more about Brilliant, go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free. And also, the first two other people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. That's the subscription I've been using to explore their multitude of thought-provoking puzzles. Next week, we will come back to Earth to consider how we might evacuate our planet if some disaster was going to render it uninhabitable, and look at everything from the most basic ways to save some remnant of our civilization up to moving the whole ecology of our planet elsewhere in Evacuation Earth. And the week after, we will be joined by astrophysicist Paul Sutter to examine many of the various theories for how the universe might end. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.